A teen and her boyfriend who killed her father learned their fate in court today. In the realm of unthinkable tragedies, a chilling phenomenon has emerged. It had pieces of my mother's brain stuck to it. This is a dark reflection of innocence corrupted and lives shattered. Picture a scenario where the guardians or parents become the targets of violence by the ones they are supposed to protect. This unsettling reality confronts us with the harrowing truth that children, those entrusted with care and protection, can become perpetrators of unthinkable acts. How could such a horrifying betrayal of trust occur? Join us as we find answers to this question. I am sorry for taking our parents and our sins. I wish I could take it back, but reality is that we can't. Nehemiah Grigo. In the hushed confines of the courtroom, Nehemiah Grigo stood as a solitary figure, his once youthful countenance now etched with the weight of his unspeakable actions. The world remembered him as the boy who shattered the tranquility of his family home, leaving behind a trail of devastation and despair. But who was the man standing before the judge, sentenced to a lifetime behind bars for the murders of his own parents? Nehemiah's story began long before the courtroom drama unfolded. Raised in a household marred by dysfunction and discord, he found solace in the shadows where demons whispered promises of power and control. But how does a child become the architect of his family's destruction? On that fateful night of January 19, 2013, before Nehemiah's hands became stained with the blood of his parents and siblings, he was going through his parents' dower when he found two loaded guns. He stood for a while looking at the object in his hand before heading to his mother's room and shooting her, then went to his younger brother's room, told him what he had done, and then ended his life immediately. There in a room across the hallway is a room with two crying girls, his younger sisters. They were scared because they knew something wrong was happening, but as fate would have it, Nehemiah walked up to them, looked them straight in the eyes, and killed his sisters. After killing his mom, brother, and sisters, Nehemiah walks down to the sitting room where he waited for his father to get back home from the shelter where he works. And as soon as his father opened the door, he met death in the hands of his 15-year-old son. Did Nehemiah understand the gravity of his actions, or was he merely a pawn in a game played by forces beyond his control? After this ordeal, Nehemiah drove his father's car down to his church where he told his pastor and an older member of the church that his whole family has been killed pretending to be innocent. His pastor and the older member of the church horrid to his home where their eye met a sight they'd never forget. They quickly dialed 911 and Nehemiah was arrested because all evidence pointed at him. In court, after receiving three life sentences immediately, the guilt of his crying covered him and he tendered an apology to his dead family. As the gavel fell and the sentence was handed down, Nehemiah's world shrank to the confines of a prison cell, a stark reminder of the consequences of his choices. But behind the stoic facade, turmoil raged within him, a tempest of emotions too complex to unravel. How does one come to terms with a life stolen by their own hands? Not just any life, the life of your whole family, what a heavy burden to carry. Seth Privacy. The disturbing tales of Seth Pravacki is a bold example of how the words of a parent can trigger a ticking bomb no one knows about. In the annals of crime, some stories etch themselves into the collective consciousness, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and shattered lives. One such is that of Seth Pravacki. Seth killed his whole family in just one night out of resentment and anger. On that fateful night in November 29, 1998, he had a heated argument within his father, and out of anger his father told he isn't loved and they do not want him. After saying all these, Seth's father left home to pick his grandfather, while Seth went upstairs, overdosed on LSD. While the effect of the drug started setting in, he took his father's gun, went downstairs where his brother was watching TV, and shot him in the head while not feeling guilty, he waited for his father and grandfather to come in, and he shot them too. The only family remaining alive was his mother who was in the bathroom washing herself clean for the night. What would he do? Will he have to end the life of his mother too? Well, he did just that. Few hours after he was done killing his family, his brother's girlfriend, April Boss, came visiting, and without a second thought, 
he took her life too. Finally, the effect of the drug he took started wearing off and guilt came running down his spine. But it was too late and he couldn't turn back the hands of time. He called his friend, Stephen Clayton Wallace, to come help take care of the scene, and he did, or at least he tried to. Because in the process of trying to clean the mess, April's parents walked in as she wasn't picking her calls, and their instinct felt something was off. Immediately, they called 911 and Seth was arrested. But what drives a son to extinguish the lives of those who brought him into this world? Was it simmering resentment, buried deep within the recesses of Seth's psyche? Or perhaps it was a momentary lapse of reason, a fatal convergence of anger and impulse? These questions linger, haunting the minds of those who dare to delve into the abyss of Seth's mind. As Seth stood before the judge, his fate sealed by the verdict of the jury, what thoughts raced through his mind? Did he grapple with the enormity of his actions, the irreversible damage he had inflicted upon his family and himself? Or did he retreat into a realm of denial, refusing to acknowledge the gravity of his crimes? Well, he showed no remorse in court as he wore a face that lacked any expression. Today, Seth is dead, not because he got a death sentence, but because he attempted to escape from prison on July 2021 during a botched prison escape. He died the same way all his victims died, a shot in the head. Sierra Hayseth. In a quiet suburb where picket fences lined the streets and neighbors exchanged pleasantries, lurked a chilling tale that would send shivers down the spines of even the most hardened souls. Sierra Hayseth, a name once whispered with admiration, now echoed with dread and disbelief. Sierra's story was not one of rags to riches, but of a descent into the depths of darkness. Born into a seemingly normal family, she was nurtured with love and care, his future brimming with promise. Yet somewhere along the path of adolescence, the shadows began to consume her. It all started in 2011 when her parents divorced and she was the center of it all. Following the child custody battle, her father won and she started staying with her father. As she grappled with the loneliness and emotional tremor of her parents' divorce, she met the love of her life, Aaron Guerrero, who became the sunshine in her cloudy life. Shortly after that, her father noticed her romantic life and her plan to run away with Aaron, and he shunned her to stop talking to him. Daniel Halseth wanted to come between her happiness, and she didn't want that. To make their plan work, her father had to leave the picture and for good. On the 9th of April, 2021, Sierra and her boyfriend stabbed her father 70 times, stole some money from him, and ran away into the sunset to begin their happy ever after journey. But as fate would have it, on the 13 of April 2021, just four days after they eloped, they were caught by the police for deboarding the light rail with no ticket. While they were under arrest, videos of them cheerfully admitting to the murder was found in Sierra's phone and they were arrested and given life sentences with the possibility of parole after 22 years. How do you think Sierra would react to this? Well, she showed no emotions and wasn't sorry for her act. Zachary Davis Zachary Davis was a troubled teenager whose life took a tragic turn when he committed matricide, killing his own mother. It had pieces of my mother's brain stuck to it. Born into what seemed like an ordinary family in a suburban neighborhood, Zachary's upbringing birthed the darkness that would eventually consume him. Reports suggest that Zachary's relationship with his mother was tumultuous marked by conflict and tension. While the exact motives behind the killing may never be fully understood, it is believed that a combination of mental health issues, family dynamics, and perhaps even external stressors contributed to his actions. Like many adolescents grappling with mental health challenges, Zachary's struggles likely went unnoticed or untreated until it was too late. The stigma surrounding mental illness often prevents individuals from seeking help, and in Zachary's case, it may have exacerbated his feelings of isolation and despair. One fateful night, he went into his mother's room and hit her 20 times with a sledgehammer and quickly went into their gaming room, soaked his clothes in alcohol and set it on fire. Now Zachary had a brother, and like the other kids, he had wanted him dead too. But his plan was to create an accident scene where the police would think his mother and brother died in the fire, and he survived. But unfortunately for him, he shut the game room, and the fire didn't spread as he thought it would, but it woke his brother Josh up who ran to tell his mother the house was on fire, but upon getting to her room he found he was gruesomely killed. He called 911 and the police arrested Zachary. During his trial, he excitedly detailed how he killed his mother, and how if he was given another chance, he would kill his brother too. Well, this right here is obviously a mentally disturbed 15-year-old, but that didn't stop the jury from giving him a well-deserved life sentencing. Sarah Johnson 
Teenagers can sometimes go crazy when they fall in love. And there's no better example than the story of Sarah Johnson. Johnson, a pretty rich kid, gained notoriety for her involvement in a shocking crime that rocked her community. Born into a seemingly affluent family, Sarah's life took a dark turn when she was convicted of murdering her parents in their Idaho home at the age of 16. The case garnered widespread media attention due to its grisly nature and the apparent lack of motive. Sarah's trial painted a picture of a troubled teenager, struggling with issues of rebellion, family dynamics, and possibly undiagnosed mental health issues. Despite the absence of a clear motive, prosecutors argued that Sarah was driven by a desire for freedom and financial gain. The prosecution's case relied heavily on circumstantial evidence, including Sarah's behavior before and after the murders, as well as conflicting statements she made to investigators. But why would they rule the fact that not being with her boyfriend Bruno Santos was enough reason? When it's clear she shot her parents because they objected to her relationship with a drug dealer? Well, that's the courtroom for you. Throughout the trial, Sarah maintained her innocence, claiming that she was at a friend's house at the time of the killings. However, the jury ultimately found her guilty, and she was sentenced to two consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole. The case sparked debates about juvenile justice, mental health, and the influence of privilege in the legal system. Some argued that Sarah's affluent background afforded her access to a skilled defense team and resources that may have influenced the outcome of the trial. Others questioned whether Sarah's age at the time of the crime should have been taken into greater consideration during sentencing. What do you think? Dylan Shoemaker. The courtroom was packed with family and friends supporting the defendant, Dylan Shoemaker, and the victim's family. In a heartbreaking case that shook the community, a Springville teenager, Dylan Shoemaker, has been found guilty of intentional murder in the tragic death of a 23-month-old child he was babysitting. The state Supreme Court jury reached a swift verdict taking less than three hours to convict Shoemaker for the brutal beating that occurred last spring. The incident unfolded when Shoemaker, then 16 years old, was caring for his girlfriend's son, Austin Smith, inside their shared Springville home. Admitting to losing his temper, Shoemaker confessed to slapping, spanking, and ultimately slamming the defenseless toddler on the floor. He even resorted to punching the child multiple times in the head through a pillow. The injuries sustained by young Austin proved fatal, leading to his untimely passing. Prosecutors presented evidence demonstrating that the severity of the child's injuries directly caused his death. However, establishing the crucial element of intent posed a challenge for the prosecution, as Shoemaker maintained that he never intended to kill the toddler during his testimony. Erie County District Attorney Frank Sedita III acknowledged the difficulty of proving intentional murder in cases involving the death of an infant. He reflected on the inherent disbelief people experience when confronted with the notion that an innocent child's life could be intentionally taken. Nevertheless, the jury was convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that Shoemaker had indeed intended to cause the toddler's death. Awaiting sentencing, Shoemaker faces a maximum sentence of up to 25 years to life in prison. Shoemaker, who was tried as an adult, would not be eligible for parole until the age of 41, effectively spending the majority of his life behind bars. While some individuals expressed disappointment with the verdict, believing that a lesser charge would have been more fitting, the victim's family mourned the loss of Austin Smith and extended forgiveness towards Shoemaker. The child's maternal great-grandmother, Rita Little, emphasized the importance of moving forward and finding solace in forgiveness as it aligns with their faith. Tracy Smith, Austin Smith's maternal grandmother, expressed empathy for Shoemaker's family, recognizing the profound impact this tragedy has had on them. She acknowledged the irreversible consequences faced by the convicted teenager, stating that his life has been irreparably altered at a young age. As the community grapples with the aftermath of this devastating incident, the trial's conclusion brings a sense of closure to the legal proceedings. However, the emotional wounds inflicted upon both families involved will undoubtedly endure, serving as a solemn reminder of the fragility of life and the consequences of one's actions. Now, it's time for today's subscriber pick. In a cramped courtroom, tension hung thick in the air as the judge delivered the verdict. The accused, a nervous teenager, sat frozen in his seat, his heart pounding in his chest. 
The sentence hit him like a sledgehammer. Life in prison. Panic surged through him like a tidal wave, drowning out reason. With a sudden surge of adrenaline, the teenager bolted from his seat, darting towards the nearest exit. Eyes wide with desperation, he intended to push past startled bailiffs, his only thought to escape the suffocating grip of justice. Rhetorical questions raced through his mind. How could this be happening? Was this really his fate? But before he could move further, he was caught by the court police. Freedom proved elusive as strong arms closed in around him, pulling him back from the brink. In that fleeting moment of defiance, he was not just a criminal, but a scared and desperate child, clinging to the last shreds of hope. As he was dragged away, his anguished cries filled the courtroom, a stark reminder of the fragility of youth in the face of harsh reality. Tell us in the comment section, what do you think about teenagers getting life sentences? Tyler Hadley On July 16, 2011, in Port St. Lucie, Florida, Tyler Hadley, 17 years old, threw a party at his family home that would go down in infamy. The party itself started innocuously enough, with music, alcohol, and a gathering of teenagers enjoying the summer night. However, what unfolded within the walls of the Hadley residence would shock the community and horrify the nation. Unbeknownst to the partygoers just hours before the festivities began, Tyler bludgeoned his parents, Blake and Mary Jo Hadley, to death with a hammer. After committing this unspeakable act, Tyler proceeded to clean up the crime scene and then hosted the party as if nothing had happened. As the night progressed, rumors began to circulate among the guests about the unsettling absence of Tyler's parents. Some brushed off the whispers, attributing their absence to a weekend getaway or simply not wanting to cramp their son's style. Others grew suspicious, but the allure of the party overshadowed any concerns they may have had. It wasn't until the following day, when Tyler confessed to a close friend via Facebook chat, that the truth began to emerge. In a chilling message, Tyler admitted to killing his parents and expressed his desire to throw a party before ending his own life. Horrified, the friend immediately contacted the police, who arrived at the scene to find Tyler visibly disturbed but cooperative. The discovery of the bodies sent shockwaves through the community, leaving friends, neighbors, and classmates grappling with disbelief and horror. How could a seemingly ordinary teenager commit such a heinous act? What drove Tyler to murder his own parents in cold blood? As details of Tyler's troubled past emerged, a portrait of a troubled young man struggling with mental health issues and substance abuse began to take shape. Reports indicated that Tyler had a history of behavioral problems and had previously been hospitalized for psychiatric evaluation. Despite concerns raised by family members and mental health professionals, Tyler's downward spiral went unchecked, culminating in the tragic events of that fateful night. In the aftermath of the killings, Tyler was arrested and charged with two counts of first-degree murder. He ultimately pleaded no contest to the charges and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. It also underscores the need for greater awareness and resources to address the underlying issues that contribute to acts of violence within our communities. As Tyler serves out his sentence behind bars, the scars of his actions continue to haunt those who knew him and the community he once called home. Jacob Morgan In a heart-wrenching case that unfolded in Rock Hill, South Carolina, a devastating fire tragically took the life of 14-month-old Joshua Hill on March 2015. Jacob Matthew Morgan, a 17-year-old autistic boy, openly wept in court as he pleaded guilty to starting the blaze that claimed his toddler half-brother's life. The courtroom was filled with raw emotions as Morgan's family stood by his side, vehemently proclaiming his innocence. Julie Hill Dover, Morgan's mother, passionately declared her son's innocence, stating, We have always believed in his innocence, because we know our son, we know the evidence against is horrible, but I know in my heart that my son, my oldest son, is innocent. She emphasized the strong bond between Morgan and his late brother, expressing that all Morgan ever wanted was a brother, and the time they had together was far too short. The tragic incident occurred when Morgan was left to care for Joshua by his mother and stepfather, Mike Hill. According to Morgan's parents, he was asleep when the fire broke out, and they argue that he was prevented from re-entering the burning home by neighbors who held him back. However, Deputy Solicitor Willie Thompson contended that Morgan's actions, such as waiting outside the home and failing to call for help or rescue his brother, indicated malice. The case became increasingly complex, 
as investigators discovered that Morgan had given conflicting accounts of how the fire started. Initially, he claimed to have accidentally thrown a pillow near a heater, but later admitted to lighting a pillow on fire and throwing it in the air. Fire experts found evidence of two separate fires, one in the living room and another on a blanket in the master bedroom, where Joshua was sleeping. Prosecutors also revealed that Morgan had confessed to setting a fire in the house two weeks prior, citing his fascination with fire. During the sentencing, Morgan, visibly emotional, expressed his love for his late brother and his deep regret. I love my brother. I still do to this very day. He's my best friend. To kill him would be killing a piece of myself. He was the only brother I ever had, and I just wish I could have gotten to him in time, he tearfully stated. Taking a plea deal, Morgan pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter, unlawful conduct towards a child, and third-degree arson. The murder charge was dropped. He received a five-year sentence for involuntary manslaughter and a 10-year sentence for unlawful conduct towards a child. The sentences will run consecutively, resulting in a total of 15 years in prison. Additionally, Morgan was given a 15-year sentence for arson, but this was suspended, and he will serve five years on probation. Following the hearing, Mike Hill defended Morgan, emphasizing his son's compassionate nature and the difficulties he will face in prison. He shared a touching anecdote, recounting how Morgan called his mother at work in tears when a newborn kitten fell ill, showing his sensitive side. Morgan's defense attorney acknowledged the challenging nature of the case, describing Morgan as a very gentle soul. As the courtroom emptied, the tragedy left a lasting impact on everyone involved. The loss of young Joshua Hill serves as a solemn reminder of the devastating consequences of that fateful fire. While Jacob Matthew Morgan's tearful plea and subsequent sentencing evoke a profound sense of empathy and compassion, Daniel Patrick. This next murder case showcases the tragic consequences of video game obsession. In a shocking story that unfolded in Northeast Ohio, a teenager named Daniel Petrick was convicted of a heinous crime. On October 20 o'clock, Petrick shot his parents after they took away his beloved Microsoft game, Halo 3. The judge presiding over the case noted that Petrick's intense fixation on the video game might have blurred the lines between the virtual world and reality, leading him to believe that death was not real. 17-year-old Petrick, facing the possibility of life without parole, appeared in Lorain County Common Pleas Court for his sentencing. As the judge offered him an opportunity to speak, Patrick shook his head slightly, fought back tears, and remained silent. His eyes were red from crying, and his anguish was palpable. Mark Petrick, Daniel's father and the survivor of the tragic incident, pleaded with the judge to show leniency, highlighting his son's remorse and constant reminders of regret for killing his mother. He's told me that many times, Mark Petrick said, emphasizing Daniel's sorrow over his mother's death. The father shared that Daniel often expressed how much he missed his mother, a poignant reminder of the irrevocable loss they all endured. Despite Mark Patrick's impassioned plea, his son's remorse was disputed by the prosecution, who argued for the maximum sentence. The courtroom was filled with Patrick's family members, including his sister and grandfather, who attended the hearing in Illyria, situated approximately 20 miles southeast of Cleveland. Tears were shed as the gravity of the situation weighed heavily on those present. The defense, in an attempt to mitigate Patrick's culpability, cited his young age and addiction to the video game as factors that diminished his responsibility. However, the court recognized the severity of the crime and the devastating impact it had on the Patrick family. Lorraine County Common Pleas Judge James Burge sentenced Daniel Petrick to 23 years in prison, a significant portion of his youth spent behind bars. The incident served as a stark reminder of the potential dangers of unchecked obsession with violent video games. Halo 3, a popular game among teenagers, immerses players in a world where they combat alien monsters that have taken over the Earth. For Petrick, the boundaries between fantasy and reality became tragically blurred leading to an irreversible act of violence. This case highlights the importance of responsible gaming habits, parental guidance, and fostering a healthy understanding of the distinction between virtual worlds and real-life consequences. It serves as a sobering reminder to society about the potential risks associated with excessive immersion in violent video games, urging us to prioritize balanced and mindful engagement with these forms of entertainment. As Daniel Petrick begins his lengthy prison sentence, the tragedy serves as a poignant reminder of the irreversible consequences that can arise from unchecked obsession and the desperate need for responsible and informed choices within the gaming community. 
Jake Evans. On October 3, 2012, the lives of an upscale Alito family in Texas were forever changed when 17-year-old Jacob Ryan Evans allegedly committed a heinous crime. What began as an ordinary day of hitting golf balls, running errands with his grandmother, and watching television at home took a dark turn when Evans reportedly took a stolen gun belonging to his grandfather and fatally shot his mother and 15-year-old sister before turning himself in to authorities. Details from Evans' statement to the police, obtained by various news agencies, paint a chilling picture of the events that unfolded. The teenager admitted that his intentions had been far more sinister, as he had planned to continue the spree by targeting more relatives. However, an unexpected surge of remorse abruptly halted his deadly mission. According to the statement, confessing his actions and revealing his inner turmoil. I hate the feeling of killing someone, he told the operator. I thought it would be quick, you know? I didn't want them to feel any pain. That's why I used the gun. It was like everything went wrong. In a subsequent statement to the police, Evans disclosed that he had watched a remake of the horror movie, Halloween, wherein a character kills his family without remorse. He believed that the experience would be similar for him. Authorities confirmed that Evans's father was out of town during the tragic events. In a harrowing admission, Evans expressed remorse and declared his decision to cease the cycle of violence. I know now though that I'm done with killing, he wrote. It's the most dreadful and terrifying thing I will ever experience, and what happened last night will haunt me forever. The devastating tragedy that unfolded in the Evans family home serves as a stark reminder of the unimaginable horror that can arise from within seemingly ordinary lives. It raises profound questions about the factors that contribute to such acts of violence and the lasting impacts on both the victims and the perpetrator's own conscience. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.